let's just come into a little bit of meditation. I am going to go ahead and mute everybody right now. So if you're holding something, put it down. Feel your bottom really secure and stable on your chair. Wiggle out through the back a little bit. Maybe some shoulder circles. Draw one shoulder forward and the other back for a breath. And then switch and let that shoulder come forward. Feel a little gentle twist. Might feel nice to draw the shoulders all the way up to the ears for a moment and really scrunch through the back of the neck and through the shoulders and then release the shoulders down. Really feel the shoulder blades melt down towards the earth behind you. With your eyes open for a moment, as you take your next breath or two, be aware of where you are. Notice the sensation of the chair beneath you. Notice the lighting where you are. Notice the time of day and how you know that based on the lighting. Notice what objects are near you and the shape and the form and the colors that you see. And then when you're ready, close down your eyes or drop your eyelids so that you're looking down towards the floor. Take a full inhalation and exhalation and simply notice how it feels to be in this place in this moment. What's the temperature of the air against your skin? What's the sensation of your breath as you inhale, the texture, the temperature, the smoothness of your breath? What's the sensation of your body in relationship to gravity in this moment? A sense of weightedness, groundedness. You visualize that you could just release into gravity as if you could drop away whatever gripping or tightness you might be carrying in this moment. There's a sense of simply being in this place, in this time. You notice your breath at the belly. With each inhalation and exhalation, you soften just a little more deeply through the soft belly. There's a letting go around the stomach and the solar plexus. There's a release through the groins and the waist. As you inhale, you notice a little lightening through the front body and up the spine. With each inhalation, you feel the spine grow a little bit longer, the crown of the head reach towards the sky. You visualize the sky above you, whether you're indoors or out. You imagine that your exhalation could come in through the air around you, around your face and your nose. And as you exhale, you imagine that you could send shoots of energy and light out through the crown of your head up into the sky. You visualize the color of the sky and the clouds. Imagining that you could be floating on your own cloud, looking down at yourself in this place where you are. What would you observe?
What do you imagine the tops of the trees look like as the leaves are just beginning to unfurl? Are there blossoms still on some of the trees or are they fully leafed out? Can you imagine that you could see yourself from above, whatever would be in front of you if you were outdoors? What would be behind you? And what would be on your left? And on the right? With your next exhalation, keeping the awareness of where you are, what you could visualize, bring your attention into your hips and your feet and imagine what is beneath you. Imagine the sensation of the crust of the earth underneath the foundation, if you're indoors, underneath the grasses, outdoors. Imagine the first couple of inches of soil, any of the critters that live there that keep that soil nourished, you might in your mind's eye, visualize a layer of leaf litter, blossoms from this year that have already dropped. All the grateful insects and wildlife to have that nourishment of the soil beneath you. You begin to move your awareness and attention into the earth beneath you down a foot or two feet or five feet and how would that feel what is down there the heaviness the weightedness of compacted earth you visualize ancient rocks and sediment you imagine eons ago, what was in this place and what was the earth like when this was an ocean? Connecting to how it feels today and how you visualize it might have been over the eons. And take a full inhalation and a full exhalation. Bring your awareness up into your forehead, into your brain, into your thoughts. Imagine softening through your eyes with the optic nerve, letting go all of that activity through your eyes with all the thoughts you've had this morning, memories that have come up, and there's just a softening release. There's this sensation, even if your eyes are closed, that behind your eyelids, they're still open and they're still active. And you soften the eyeballs, the muscles behind the eyes, you soften through the temples and the eyebrows and the forehead. Bring into your mind's eye the place in nature that you talked about when we went through our introductions. Imagining your favorite place in nature, and you're welcome to change it if you've had thoughts or an idea about some place that you didn't mention earlier, and just imagine you could be there.
Imagine how it would be to step into this place. How would it feel under your feet? With your eyes so soft and so open, what would you notice? What would you see? What shapes and objects? Can you imagine you could look around in all directions. What would you be surrounded by, immersed in, in this place? What colors would you notice? What movement of the breeze, of critters, flow of water? You imagine in your visualization, you could just soften your sense of hearing. Imagining you could put out antenna to listen and hear whatever sounds would surround you in this place. You might notice the sounds of birds, critters rustling in the trees. Where you are might include the sound of waves or water lapping, flowing. And there's the sound of the breeze and the flutter of leaves. You bring your awareness to your sense of smell and imagine you could just soften around the nose, the nostrils, the nasal passages. There's a receptivity through your cheeks and the cheekbones. And as you inhale this place in your mind's eye, you notice the fragrances, you notice the aromas that come in. You notice first the fragrance on the breeze, blossoms, you imagine that you could inhale the scent of every leaf and every bloom and every rock. There's an aroma through the tree bark. the deep earthy scent of the decaying leaves. Healthy soil. With your next inhalation, imagine that you're breathing in the aroma of this place and watch what happens to your breath. As you inhale, and your entire body is receptive and receiving this inhalation. You notice how that feels in your heart. And you set the intention to remember how this feels through all of your senses, knowing that you can bring back this state of ease and peace and joy anytime you'd like. And then take a full inhalation And a full exhalation. And when you're ready, you can gradually crack your eyes open and come back into the room.
or wherever you are. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Kim, inviting you to just be cognizant of where you are now and where you love to be, and just kind of let that meander through your mind as he takes it away. So Ken, it's all yours. All right, so you've unmuted me, looks like. I've unmuted you. Okay, so, well, thank you for that great um, preparation for this uh, discussion, and I, um, you know, I encourage people to ask questions if they have them and uh, figure out how to do that. I also uh, uh, feel like this is a, going to be a continuation of what um, Sammy so generously has provided on her website uh, with the Resilient Activist series that I started. Can everybody hear me okay? There's, there's a little bit of... Uh, ambient noise with the birds and uh, there's a highway way over there and then so if if anybody has trouble feel free to uh to say speak up or get closer to the uh, microphone or whatever um and so the series has been to inv uh the goal is inviting nature back into your um into your world and that seems kind of um like theoretical but it actually is very visceral and it's very um it's it's based on our relationship of our bodies to the rest of the planet and to the rest of the universe and we experience the universe directly through our bodies our bodies have evolved to interact with our surroundings and our surroundings connect us to larger and larger circles reaching all the way out and so i'm um going to spend a little bit of time talking about um how the um the visible universe is in our backyards and it's in our surroundings immediately surrounding us and even if we're inside uh we can look out through the window and there it is and um there's something very powerful about that, and there's lots of ways of making that more visible. I think that there's lots of ways that we've made that invisible in our lives. And I'm going to try this. Let's try a, a short PowerPoint here. Uh, let me see if I can figure out how to do this. Okay. So I'm going to click on the share button. And let's see. County. I think I think I have to go here. Let's try that. Let's see. Okay. So I'm gonna can everybody see this? Yes. Now I can okay. see. Okay, so this is um it's actually looking straight down at some prairie in the um, in the fall, and I decided to pick the fall because we're part of an annual cycle. And even though if I went to the same spot right now, it'd look very different. I think it's important to remember that what we see in nature is part of a. It's not a place; it's a process. And. I think that's an important thing to keep in mind that everything that we are surrounded by in nature are not objects, they're processes. And um, it's easy for us to forget that, I think. Um, but I think it's a very important thing. It, it has tremendous power in it too. Um, and what I'm talking about here is what is wild. It's not what is natural and what is human, but it is what is wild. And I, I, I chose that word 
because uh, to define what I mean by wild, it's open-ended, it's dynamic, it's changing. Uh, it's not under our direct control. If you go out into your backyard, you do all kinds of things to facilitate flowers, vegetables, the lawn, and all these things, but it's really not under our direct control. As, as you know, it, it has a life of its own, but it's not a state of disorder. It may feel that way if you are gone for a month and you come back to your yard. It seems like it's chaos, but actually it's ordered internally and by processes that are beyond the reach of humanity and our actions on the planet. And so everything that you see in nature outdoors has a, a wildness to it. And that's because the entire universe is wild. And um, that's also, that also speaks to our body, okay? Uh, we experience the wildness of place through our bodies and to experience unmediated access to the universe. That means that we're not watching a movie, yet, we're actually in it. Uh, that is the unmediated access to the universe. And that relationship is through our body's senses and our interaction with the objects around us. So a lot of that has become um, fairly obscure and covered up by our culture. And it's not that our culture is bad, it's very useful and it allows us to do things that no other universe can uh, or no other um, animal can do to the extent in the way that we do it but it also covers up some of those relationships that we have with with the surroundings that we have the wild the wildness around us and so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about language time and space and how those uh, can be how they're very useful the way we use them as humans but how sometimes we have to peel away those layers in order to see better interact and understand nature around us. So language, um, it can connect us or it can remove us from the presence. Uh, as I'm talking, uh, I think your meditation, Sammy, was an excellent idea in terms of bringing us to the present. But if you were thinking of another place, you're probably thinking about the past or the future and in, in that even that nature uh, visualization. Uh, when you were talking, I was just tuning into the cardinal behind me or the cottonwood leaves rustling in the breeze right next to me or the, uh, uh, the wind on my face. So, you know, language can do that with us and also, it brings our attention to what is here or not here. Um, as people talked about mirrors, mirror woods, I thought about it because I've been there and it's a gorgeous place. And just your, some sounds coming out of your mouth can create that visualization in my mind, which is amazing. I mean, it's, it's kind of magical, really. Um, but it also, so it can make the invisible visible. I'm, I, I, I'm you know, a thousand miles away from your words, but it, I became, I had this image of your woods in my mind. Uh, but it, when I was doing that, I was not aware of, as aware of the uh, sound of the cottonwood leaves right next to me. So that is the magic of language. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, one of the things that we have to do though is be intentional with, if we want to connect with nature around us in the present, uh, is to really utilize the language of nature and utilizing the nature uh, and quieting the uh, the language parts of our mind that take us away from the present. Okay. And there's time. Um, what time is it right now? It is 1035. Okay. What does that mean? <laughs> You know, 10.35 in the morning, uh, you know, it's, if you were to ask a cougar 
to understand what the concept of time was, you could spend its entire life trying to teach it how to read a clock and it wouldn't work, okay? So that is the difference between human time and ecological time. Human time allowed us to all get together using the internet to have this discussion. It's, it's truly remarkable what it allows us to do. And so there's a real place for uh, the hours, minutes, days, uh, months, and years uh, that we utilize in our human cultures. And it's a, it's a human construct though. And it's invisible to all other species. And so ecological time is using the world. And when I talk about the world, for most animals, almost all animals, there's a sphere of awareness around each being. And that sphere of awareness uh, for many mammals includes everything that we see on the, from horizon to horizon. So there's cues, there's cues in the sky, there's cues in the weather, there's cues in the temperature, uh, all of these different things that are taking place right here. And that's ecological time. And that is the, the clock that, the, uh, that most other animals use and plants use as well. The length of daytime, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the moisture content of the soil, the warmth of the soil, all of these things play into giving cues that, you know, it's, it's hard to, it's hard for us because we don't have, uh, well, it's hard for us to say, okay, when the moisture content is 14%, let's meet at, uh, you know, on the south side of the river. We can't really do that because that's just not how our senses work, but what the ecological senses or the ecological indicators that every other animal used, and we use to a large extent uh, uh, more than we think, is that we basically, it helps coordinate between species and between different things that are happening in the same time. In other words, a, a bee will know precisely when certain flowers are just at the perfect time to get the uh, the uh, the pollen or the nectar, and then carry the pollen as an aside to from flower to flower, uh, those are things that it checks. I just spent. I remember uh, last weekend I went out to the Flint Hills, and I saw. Um, there was almost nothing happening in the prairie. Uh, prairie is a warm season grass that doesn't typically green up very much until May. But there's a few flowers out. And there was a, a bumblebee going, just combing over the grasses, checking each one of the little flowers that were almost out. Okay, it was, you know, it's amazing how much attention all of its energy was being poured into checking each one of those flowers. Uh, there's spring flowers that bloom before the grasses do. And the, the, the buds were almost ready to open up. They hadn't quite opened. And it was just checking, going down. In this one little square foot area, it spent probably five minutes checking over everything in it. And, and that's the kind of attention to detail that every other species uh, spends looking at our landscapes. And landscapes are therefore, um, they're ecological time. And that's the difference between human time and ecological time. And so for us to appreciate that type of time unfolding Sometimes we have to put our, uh, you know, we have to put our smartphones away. We have to stop looking at the clock. We have to stop uh, looking at things from uh, what day it is and start paying attention to, well, where is the moon? Where is the sun? Where, you know, what is the temperature? What is the temperature in the shade? What is the uh, state of the, uh, the unfolding of which plants and, and those kinds of things. And, and, you know, if we're interested in 
hunting other animals, we have to pay attention to what they are paying attention to. And so there's all these sequences that take place. And so that's one of the beauties of taking walks is that you as a human are using your senses in the same way as other animals are using them in terms of you're using your senses to pay attention to what other animals are doing and trying to figure out what they're paying attention to. And therefore they are informing your world of things that you can't even perceive sometimes. And that's the beauty of, of taking walks with this um, inviting nature back into your life mode as far as time goes. Now, space is a different thing. Uh, we think of, okay, I live at this address. I live at 1357 North 1000 Road, Lawrence, Kansas, in Douglas County. And uh, that's in the state of Kansas. And it's in the United States, in North America. Well, guess what? None of that matters to that cougar again. You know, none of it, absolutely none of it uh, means, or to the crow, or to the cardinal, uh, or to that cottonwood tree. Uh, these are things that we find extremely useful. I can tell Sammy my address and she can come right here. I mean, that's, that's truly remarkable. Uh, and yet for, you know, that is what our, uh, our world is focused on is how to, how do we get together? How do we do things together? And how do we get things done? And these are extremely useful things that we've developed our speech, our lang our time and our, uh, our space, spatial orientation. But for, you know, for, well, if you want to look at the eco regions as an example, eco regions are a, uh, an integrative concept. Uh, believe it or not, the left half of that map is Kansas and the right half is in Missouri. And, but you can barely see it because what an eco region is, it's an area of common um, vegetation and animal um, ecosystem landscapes. Okay, so that if you go to the Osage Quest, uh, um, which is um, uh, the name of the eco region where Topeka is, and you can see that right in the middle, a little bit to the left. Kansas City is right in the transition between the uh, the Osage Cuesta eco region and the uh, uh, the Okikri woodlands to the uh, to the east, and then also there's the uh, Missouri River corridors that are uh, following the Missouri River, and so these are areas where for instance oops i didn't mean to do that how do i go back uh, let's see i have to get out maybe maybe i can go back whoop there we go okay so um basically if i was in uh, topeka and i fell asleep in a car i could go down to just north of tulsa and wake up and uh, Topeka is in Shawnee County and I can just say, oh, I just drove to another part of the county. And you woke up and you wouldn't know any difference. It would be basically, you, you could say, oh, well, this is an interesting area I haven't been in in Shawnee County. Or same with, uh, you know, maybe just, uh, north of Pittsburgh, I could, uh, uh, you know, in the wooded areas, I could go there, fall asleep and then go over uh, in the central Missouri and wake up and, and you know, that's what an eco region is, okay? So eco regions are ways of ordering space so that animals know uh, what kind of habitat they can comfortably live in. And these are areas that are important to other mammals and other plants actually, uh, in terms of where they find it easiest to live year in and year out. And that's why they're there. So uh, eco regions is another way of peeling back the layers of our addresses and our orientation in, in the human world and starting to pay attention to, oh, so this is what it means to live in 
the Osage Cuesta eco region or the Okikri woodlands. And then starting ex exploring what that means in terms of the dominant plants or the dominant animals. What is the interaction? What is the, the seasons? Uh, how does it look? Um, you know, when is the, you know, how, how does the water flow? And that brings us to another thing in space, um, which is the um, watersheds. And I'll talk a little bit more about watersheds when I when we talk about the different uh, walks that we're going to take. Um, but one of the other things I wanted to talk about in terms of integrating space and time is the seasons. And that's um, if you think about the seasons, the seasons are caused by the Earth going around the sun. Well, that's pretty much a perfect circle. It's a little bit different, a slightly, slightly different. Uh, it's a slight ellipse instead of a perfect circle, but it's pretty darn close. Our seasons come from the tilt in our uh, planet's axis, not from how close we are and how far away we are from the sun. The sun actually is closer in the wintertime than it is in the summertime right now. In, in 12,000 years, it'll be the other way around because the, the ellipse slowly rotates as um, very, very slowly over thousands and thousands of years. But the bottom line is, it's a cyclical process. We think in terms of our conceptions of a year, we think, well, it begins January 1st and it ends in December 31st. Well, it doesn't. <laughs> I mean, where, did this, where does the planet start in its circulation, its re revolution around the sun? Uh, you know, we don't know. I mean, it's, it's billions and billions of years ago when that started and it continues and it will continue for billions and billions of years more. And so thinking of the cycles, um, your area where you live is unlike any other place on the planet, okay? It has a little bit different, uh, like I'm further west from you folks and that means that maybe it's a little bit drier uh, it may be a little bit uh, warmer, more extreme weather. Uh, it may, uh, you know, for people who are n north of you, they see the spring unfolding a little bit later. To the people to the south of you, it's uh, unfolding a little bit earlier. To the east, there may be a, a different uh, set of uh, plants and animals. So everything is really unique in your area. And And I made these charts back in, 1985 um, and this is an overview of some of the big cycles because I was I had seen um, some charts made in uh, the Rocky Mountains and I saw that it was a wonderful thing uh, to conceptualize things in this way and I couldn't find anything that was done in this area so I, I drew up these charts these are kind of if we want to look at um, April because we're in April, why not? Uh, you know, woodland fires are beginning, trees are opening their leaves, uh, some row crops are being planted. Uh, there's uh, spawning season for most fish is, is going to be beginning. Uh, birds, insects, frogs are more active after a rain. Um, coyotes, badgers, raccoons are giving birth, prairie chicken booming is uh, migratory songbirds are arriving and waterfowl are heading north. So it's also a pretty windy time of the year. And if you look in the night sky, you see the Big Dipper uh, and also Leo high in the south. So there's an example of what's going on in, as an overview. And then I did a series of other charts that shows, uh, this is for the Kansas River Basin. So basically from Kansas City on west all the way out to central Colorado. Uh, the southern half of Nebraska and the northern half of Kansas. And um, so you have different wildflowers that are, are blooming, uh, you know, different times of the year. Um, this is for uh, further west, it's drier. So there's a different set of flowers uh, that bloom out there. So I made one for the further west, point west. Um, woodland vegetation. Uh, you know, oaks are leaving out, uh, elm seeds are being produced, the maples, uh, those whirly maple uh, samaras, what they're called, uh, are, are ripening right now. 
I'm looking at, and yes, the red buds are blossoming still, although they're starting to put out leaves too. Uh, there's flowers of uh, the plums and morel mushrooms. I have not looked, I have not found my first morel mushroom of the year, but it's happening and so on and so forth. Uh, mammals, uh, this is an extremely t busy time of year. A lot of animals have different gestation periods, but they're all timed typically to have young in the springtime because that's when there's the most plentiful food uh, available for either the young ones to be eating or more likely just the parents to stay, stay uh, keep up with the, the, uh, the rigors of raising a new litter of, of young ones. And so, um, you know, there's lots of activity that goes on in the spring. Uh, insects, reptiles, and amphibians. Each animal, each plant has its own place in this cycle. Uh, it's seasonal and year-round birds. These are showing the little uh, diamond shapes are when the peak of the, um, the breeding season is. Uh, as you can see, it's mostly in the springtime. Um, aquatic life has a similar, I was hearing about a month ago, the uh, Western chorus frogs, and they're still uh, talking right now in the background. I don't know if you can hear them. Uh, food from the, uh, uh, the land. This is where the agricultural cycle is actually just a modification of the wild cycle. So you have um, corn planting, the flint hills are being burned off, um, spring calving, uh, you've got uh, bees starting to become active. Um, in, it, in the most central part of this, you have the names of the months for um, this area that was what the Osage Indians used. Uh, they came this far north and they were mostly to the south as well, but they called it planting moon because what do we do this time of year? And then there's a whole series of very interesting, you know, if you think about what is April, well, what does that tell us about where we live? It doesn't tell us anything. May doesn't tell us anything about uh, where we are now. But little flower killer moon is a great example of the spring flowers that I was talking about that that bumblebee was looking at. Well, they all die out because the grasses start growing. And so the, uh, the, <laughs> You know, the, the Osage noticed that, and so they decided to call the month of May Little Flower Killer Moon as they faded out and the, uh, the grasses started growing. And so there's, all of these are very place-based names for what's going on. Once again, it helps us to attune to what's going on in nature as opposed to, you know, August was named after Caesar Augustus, um, September, you know, that means the number seven, and it's not even the seventh month anymore. Uh, so, you know, there's all of the, these different things that uh, take us away from the present in a way. Uh, and of course, all of the months were named after moons. And, and so, you know, that's another thing that that helps us uh, attune ourselves to when we become aware of what the moons were called. Because, uh, you know, what, what is true about uh you know eastern kansas western missouri is very different from the northeast uh you know in the adirondacks or, or whatnot so they wouldn't have called it little flower color moon they would have called it something else and that's okay it should call it something else okay so i'm gonna click this to exit the presentation here and Okay, how do I get back out of here? I think I just click. Okay. So are we back to uh, our group here? Yes, I think we're back now. There was a little delay between every time you change the screen until uh, we could see it, but it was it was great. Oh my gosh. So are you ready for Q&A or do you have some more before we jump? In? Yeah, uh, this might be a good stopping point for people to ask questions, um, comments, uh, you know, whatever. 
Cool. If you want to do I, I have a comment. I mean, first of all, Ken just floors me. This is like just to to be able to viscerally see this. Mary Beth says your circle charts are amazing, Ken, and they are. And I just want to add this perception of time. Um, so bees, honeybees, and other bees. They measure time in how often a particular flower that's in bloom that they're attracted to, how often it can replenish its nectar. So when yeah. you have a bee that goes and takes the nectar from a blossom, if another bee's right on its tail, there's no nectar there. That's a waste of energy for the second bee. The first bee leaves something called a scent marker and it's just like a little dollop of liquid. And when another bee gets close to that blossom and it smells that scent marker, it's like, oh, I'm not gonna waste my time there. I'm gonna go to a different blossom. And in the length of time till that scent marker dissipates is equal to the length of time that that blossom regenerates more nectar. It's like this whole different way of being. And, um, Anyway, this is great. So anyone who'd like to speak, um, those of you who we can't see your faces, just unmute yourself. Um, who would like to ask a question? Anyone, anyone? I wanna say something real quick in response to what you said, Sammy. Um, the, uh, um, to me, to, to those details that you were just talking about and, and just the observations of, of nature is that there's, a, there's this whole world, uh, there's a whole series of worlds out there that have nothing to do with us. And that's what I mean by wild. Uh, and it's something that, to me, it's very exciting and comforting because it means that, it, number one, it doesn't depend on us uh to run those things there's these things have been going on since way before humans were even around a lot of these things were and secondly it it gives us uh great hope i think for how we can learn from these things that have been going on longer than we even exist uh to me there's there's great intelligence in this intelligence isn't just from us it's it's found everywhere and uh there's a real um a real strength in that that i think that we can draw from and learn from the solutions that other animals and plants have come up with to help ourselves get through this bottleneck i love it ken mary beth yes hi, hi i'm glad you're here yeah i yeah it, this is beautiful uh, the, yeah it really is so um ken how can um how can we you those those circle charts are beautiful so how can i guess <laughs> i'd like to start <laughs> making one um yes and but uh, so you just kind of make like I would just start by making, like drawing it out and then doing my own observations. You um, know, that's, a, a, that's actually exactly what I did. And what I did is um, I spent a couple of years, you know, just spending time doing research, but also, you know, taking endless walks, uh, lots and lots of walks throughout the, the growing seasons and and the winter time too because you know there's stuff going on every day of every year and, yeah and the, so you the, become those are aware amazing. of the patterns and um the i think it's the first uh part one of the uh series that i did at brazilian activist has a uh link actually to somebody who provides blank circles uh that you can download or uh, i think you can get printed versions you can buy uh and that's a great way to do what you're talking about it's almost uh, so, like a mandala it i mean like in yes. a, i mean it just yeah. is that sir i don't it just reminds me of that concept 
Of yes, and that's Amanda what it was Hello. very exciting to me too. When I first saw one, I thought, oh, this is, uh, there's something about the mandala type uh, perception that really spoke to me too. And yeah. I think that, that um, you know, mine is pretty factual. I've seen people take the circles. If you go to this, uh, my friend's website, people just make beautiful drawings uh, that are kind of like a sequential thing uh, that looks beautiful. There's many, many ways to do this, wow. to chart your, your perceptions and to capture those things. Even and, sound, you could, you know, you could even do it with sound. My husband and I went, um, we usually go on hikes. We're going to go to this place and go on a hike. Uh -huh. And we, you know, we observe, but a couple days ago, we just went up to the Platte River at the conservation area and just wandered. <laughs> and he was yeah. off going up one, you know, hill and I was going off and it was, you know, no, okay, we're going on a hike. It was just a, a, a wandering and it was so cool. It was, yeah. you know, just appreciating the little bitty, like in your first um, um, screens, the, the little bitty things. I love those shots at the beginning, at just focusing on the beauty. Yeah, it, just taking, looking straight down at a piece of prairie or a, a woodland floor. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing how much you can see. Or sitting for five minutes without moving, uh, rested up against a tree, nature starts coming back. You know, yeah. nature is very, very aware of your presence. And if you're just passing through, most of nature is hiding. Okay. Right. And so if you sit down and you wait, it'll start coming back. Yeah. And it's amazing. Then you can start to see so much more after a relatively short time. And that's true pretty much any time of year. Right. And that's what Sammy has done. And uh, some of the things that I've attended with her where you, you just go outside and, and connect and look at the little things. And um, that really is healing. And I know, Sammy, you, this is what your whole, you know, what, what you're about. But um, yeah, it's, it's really good. I, well, one of the things that um, I talk about a little bit in uh, the Resilient Activist, I think the first one is called the bioregional jump. And uh, it's kind of a conceptual leap where you're, uh, you're leaving behind all of the things that we've talked about that, yes, that we've created to function in, in human society. And you, so you sort of start with, and you have to know your, your, uh, the name of your town, name of your uh, uh, county, state, and say, I'm jumping out of, you know, 1357 North 1000 Road. I'm jumping up out of Douglas County. I'm jumping up out of Lawrence in the, uh, Douglas County in Kansas in the United States. I'm jumping up into the prairie winds and then I'm landing on the slope of an oak hickory transition woodland that goes into a prairie with the winds still at my uh, back. And I am, but I just, I don't know if you saw, there was a couple of birds behind me that were sitting on the, on the deck there. Um, and I'm I'm landing in the uh, eco region where I live, and I am on the slope of a creek that flows north to the Wakarusa River, and then into the Kaw River, and into the uh, that flows into the Missouri River, over to the Mississippi River, and flows into the Gulf of Mexico. And I'm connected to all these things, and That's to the cool. plants and animals who have made this place home, and then it's sort of a way to start your walk by peeling back all those layers and you're, you're then suddenly attuned in a way that uh, I think helps you kind of set the tone for your walk to pay attention to the things that uh, we've been talking about. Right. Yeah. So we're going to, we're going to take a break, a break and come back to the walk. But before we do that, 
I'm going to share my screen. Well, wait a minute before I share. Um, I want to show you, Ken has a book called Wild Douglas County, if you guys can see I'm holding it up here. And he's got all his charts are in there for one thing, <laughs> where you can actually read them. And if you come, he's got, you can go to his website, to the Wild Douglas County website. It's a CawValleyAlmanac.com. You can order a copy of the book and it's just, it's as glorious as he is. You know what I mean? Like everything that came out of his mouth today is available in that book. And then also on the Resilient Activist site, if you go to the homepage and there's a search button at the top and you click inviting nature to your home, these are the articles that Ken has written for us. Um, that's today's event. So he's written a four part series a blog post and then a special one called nature in the time of coronavirus and he talks about all these different concepts that um you know it's one thing you hear it the first time and you think that's interesting the second time you're like oh i get it a little more now and the third time there's this sense that you just want to experience that for yourself like you're ready to take it to the next level so I just kind of wanted to share that that information is available on our site and that you can get a copy of that book. After um, today's program, I will send an email out to each of you with some of the hyperlinks to at places that, or um, sites that Ken's mentioned or that, um, that Christine will mention later, so. Look at that Mary Beth giving us a tour of her gardens. That's awful sweet. Nice. It's a little early for some of the natives, I know, and I'm sure that's what you've got in your lot, your yard, Mary Beth. Uh-huh. Are those flocks? They look like flocks. That's woodland flocks, it looks like to me. Mm -hmm. Some little yellow ones. Is that Pacaro? I missed that. There wasn't a big one. There's a nice bird bath. Yeah. How pretty. You know, that would be a really fun climate conversation, wouldn't it? With everybody in their own favorite place in nature and just one at a time, they just kind of show things and we all yeah. go on, on these on everybody's garden tours. Well, that's, that's almost what will happen this afternoon, really. Yeah. <laughs> that was beautiful, Mary Beth. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was my break. <laughs> All right, I'm going back in. Thanks for sharing it with us. You're welcome. <laughs> Anybody else have any comments, any feedback, any questions, anything they think they want to try and do? Or um, Brenda, your garden looks gorgeous out where you are, too. Can't see much of it. But... Hey, Dina, take it. Hi. 
I, I just wanted to thank you uh, both and Ken uh, for inspiring me about how to talk with my uh, two young grandsons. And when you have little grandkids that are, or children that are so close to the ground, they stop and notice everything that we don't when we're walking. So the whole idea of developing a um, circle with them from the walks at different times of the year when I'm with them, unfortunately, I can't be now, but is very uh, exciting to me because not only will it allow me to slow down, but it really gives them the opportunity to use all their observational skills and create something that may be memorable for them as well. <laughs> so that's what yeah. I want to share. <laughs> You know, that kind of reminds me of um, one thing that I found that kids really like doing um, is doing a birthday walk so mm -hmm. that whenever their birthday is, you take a walk with them. And a lot of times, you know, you get to see them uh, during their birthday if, if you're coming from out of town or whatnot. Right. And you just say, okay, let's find your birthday plants and animals and see what they're up to. And then they they take a note of what's happening with the uh with the uh the dogwood and and with the cottonwood and you know you get to talk about the different kinds of plants with them and teach them their birthday plants and then you tell them about the birthday animals you know what bird is that um what's flying over there and so they can write that stuff down and then they keep this birthday walk diary for the rest of their lives and they become more and more accustomed to what's you know, they develop a personal relationship with their plants and animals around them that way in a significant way uh that well for one thing it it unfortunately uh the climate is changing and so you know if they're young now when they're uh older than we are <laughs> <laughs> then uh, they will probably have noticed some significant shifts. And I think that's important to know. And you don't ne necessarily understand that unless you have some of these anchors throughout your life where you're, you're you know, making the same observation and the same point in this Earth's revolution around the sun and see that, oh, things have changed. Um, you know, one of the things that I, find very poignant every Memorial Day is that the flowers that my great grandparents planted for us to enjoy have bloomed typically a week or two early then uh, uh, so that they're they're pretty much done with uh, with uh, the, the peonies a lot of times are, are done some years that are right on time but a lot of times they're past and that's because we have you know moved spring is moving to earlier and earlier. And so one of my challenges is to think about what can we plant now so that my great, great grandkids can enjoy uh, something that's blooming during that time. So there's lots of ways to connect um, holidays, uh, significant days like birthdays with, uh, so that you can start paying attention in ways that I think are very personal and it helps you develop that relationship thank you those are those are wonderful wonderful ideas i love the idea of the seasonal holiday and birthdays because they're so important especially to younger kids yeah yeah uh, so <clears throat> and i know ken talks about that in one of the articles one of the in the four-part series there's a little more about doing your birthday uh, walk and and keeping a birthday journal and I just wanted to add, so when we think about time in the same way that a bee's sense of time is based on how long till that plant produces more nectar, the nectar in that plant can only be regenerated in a certain time period based on the temperature at, in that moment, whether it's in the sun or it's in the shade. Um, what's happened with that particular season, the air quality and the humidity. And so the plant has its own sense of time that goes right along with that scent marker. And, and there's another 
like perception to this. Um, one of my very favorite books, although it's really hard to read, is called Faith in a Seed, and it's by Henry David Thoreau. And it was actually published in 1990 something because it didn't, they didn't find the manuscript until way after he died. And, and there wasn't anyone who was really interested in publishing it until very recently. And a sense of time for a seed would be, well, when it matures and drops from wherever it is, right? Whether it's the maple leaf and it's squir on the maple seed that squirrels down, or it's a milkweed seed that then pops out of the pod and floats on the, the white mesmer, I call it. And what happens to that seed in its time, in its life, right? And it's when, you know, Ken was saying, well, you know, does the season, does the world start January 1st? And the answer is, well, no, not, not really. And so that seed's life starts when it's first released. And, and is, does it, is it blown on the wind to some place? Or does it need to be in water and really be soaked and it flows to a different location? Or is it attached to some critter's um, hide? And, it, and that's how it moves to where it needs to go. And so this whole sense of ecological time is just um, fascinating, the facets that you could take a look at and think about. So um, I want, Ken, I want to give it back to you, but I want to just um, acknowledge that Joy Ellsworth is on. She says she's Tora and Liam, and we know that those are her children. <laughs> so she's just joining us. Joy will be leading us a little bit later on our uh, afternoon meander through Clement Water. So I'm glad you're here. So Ken, I'll take it, I'll let it, let it back to you unless anyone else has any other questions or comments before we move on. Okay, I know we lost Kathy. She went for her drive-by birthday party, but ah. she'll be back later, so. Hope she didn't forget her uh, nose. I, I'm sure she didn't forget her red nose, yeah. <laughs> okay, so, um, you know, uh, Sammy and Joy and I met yesterday just to kind of get some of the logistics and mechanics of all this together. And uh, I think uh, Joy's going to be talking a little bit about uh, some precautions and whatnot. But I, it made me think about, well, you know, there's, there's things to think about if we're taking walks in, um, in areas that are maybe not cultivated, that are not, uh, that are the wild corners and next to the woods that that are not landscaped the way that we uh, uh, you know intentional ways but that's where nature uh, is unfolding it at its best in, in many ways and um, so I just wanted to mention a few precautions of my own uh, I think Joy's going to talk a little bit about more later but if you notice, here's a pair of pants, and um, I have one of the things that I do. There's ticks, and there's triggers, and there's mosquitoes. Those are, you know, things that stop a lot of us. And if they don't stop us from going out, if we don't do anything, they will remind us of their their presence. And I use something. Uh, this is actually. Uh, it's called permethrin, and I use it, and I just spray it on the pants, um, sort of dampen it down. And um, permethrin is is a uh, it's an extract from the chrysanthemum uh, flower that actually does uh, an excellent job if if you wear these pants, you you soak them, you basically spray them down until they're soaked. Uh, or wet and then you let them dry off and then you wear them and it's good for like five or six um, washings uh, before you have to reapply this and it makes a huge difference in um, in whether or not you're spending time you know it's always good after a long walk uh, in the woods or in a prairie or whatnot to to take a shower and shower down to check yourself over for ticks and to uh, 
Well, you know, chiggers are probably not quite out yet, but they will be out in the next few weeks and then they'll be out till frost. But this makes a huge difference. It's almost night and day uh, in terms of uh, what it does to um, keep them off of you. Um, the other thing I do is I uh, take my my pants and I put those, you know, stick them into my sock. And the reason I do that is that I, it keeps things from getting inside as well. And then I take there's stuff called Sublime Sulfur that you can buy at the hardware store, or I mean the the uh, drug store, and it's a powder that I then put on. I dump it in the sock, and then I just I don't know if you can see the the, but you know you just kind of put it around all the tight areas that a chigger will get into, and. Uh, it works very well too in terms of minimizing the type of uh, problems that you would have if you don't do something like that. Other people use DEET uh, in, and, and eucalyptus oil and, and various things. But these are things to do. Um, the other thing, of course, is to use a uh, sunscreen. And I always like a, a brim hat because a brim hat protects my neck as well and it's just things that uh, that you um, it just makes things a lot easier to focus on what you want to focus on if you take those precautions and uh, it, it just makes um, inviting nature you want to invite nature into your life but you don't necessarily want to deal with some of the negative consequences of trigger bites and ticks and, and mosquitoes and the rest. So anyway. Those are good tips. I, My um, husband was tweezing, uh, <laughs> tweezing the chiggers. No, not chiggers. Um, they ticks. were Lone Star ticks. I was up last night, like at midnight, like what, with a magnifying glass trying to identify it, all these, uh, you know things on my body after that after we wandered so i'm i'm going to i'm going to use those tips yeah yeah the the ticks are out it's an excellent year for ticks it seems like <laughs> yeah and uh you know if you're ever wanting to hunt for morale mushrooms you're in the woods and whatnot if you don't do stuff like this you're just going to get them and it's uh, miserable. If your ticks are, are very, very small. They're a little bit bigger than the period on the end of a sentence, but not much. And uh, so it's easy to overlook those until you notice this itchy spot. And for me, tick bites are even worse than chigger bites as far as they're itchy for longer than, um, than even a chigger bite, which is longer than a mosquito bite, at least for my body. Oh, so. I was, I had chigger bites. I had hundreds on my legs last year when I was working at Discovery Center. I working outdoors, but they're miserable. Uh, yeah, yeah this, I think this, it's, this is, it's, great it's important to talk about these yeah. things because you know, I remember I worked on an archaeology dig in the Big Blue River, uh, River Valley, um, back in the 70s. And we would spend the day, you know, scraping off the dirt. We'd be sitting on the ground all day long. And they didn't really have very good uh, insect repellents back then. And I remember counting over 100 chigger bites on one leg one day. And mm -hmm. you just lay at nighttime, kind of glowing in this massive itch. <laughs> it's kind of a, a horrifying thing, but there are there are ways to prevent that so i highly yeah. recommend them and i want to interject just one thing on the um on the inset on the sunscreen to make sure that you're paying attention to the ingredients on the sunscreen and that it's been approved for use especially in water 
Um, there's a lot of areas, especially beach areas and so on, where that sunscreen chemicals have had a really negative impact on uh, sea life and uh, critters that live in and around the water. So just make sure that you take a look at the label and there are certain different certifications um, that you can rest assured that you're not contributing to any problems out in our waters and streamways. So. Are there some resources for finding out what, uh, what chemicals are a problem with that? Yeah, I'm, I imagine um, EWG, the Environmental Working Group, and I will look that up and, and get some resources for that. Okay. Thank you for that. So we've talked about different ways to re-inhabit your uh, ecological time and space, uh, doing the, the bioregional jump and taking birthday walks and holiday walks and and neighborhood walks is a, is a variation on that. Um, and I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what I did to, uh, to do that. I, I'm, there's a, <laughs> a neighborhood in Lawrence that I've spent time living in and uh, other people in the area who have uh, done nature. Uh, well, to make a long story short, there was a grant that was, um, East Lawrence is being gentrified uh, like so many uh, low income in neighborhoods that are adjacent to more desirable areas. Um, and one of the things that um, has come out of a, a gentrification project is that they provided some funds for um, helping document what is being lost. <laughs> but the, the cool thing about nature is that nature is going to pretty much live in the margins of pretty much any neighborhood that you uh, happen to be living in. And so um, I gave a, uh, uh, I'm, uh, my wife got a grant with a singer. She's collecting stories and songs of East Lawrence. And um, I included a nature hike as part of that. And so what I did is did a um, basic uh, walk through the neighborhood. And I just wanted to talk about the process of how I did that. Um, there is a, um, I could switch around and show this, but maybe just talking about it might be a, a good enough way to do that. And then we can decide if we want to listen to parts of it. Um, this is the high tech way of doing it. Um, and it works very well. Um, there's what I use and there's many different ways to do this. But if I get into my smartphone, I downloaded an app called um, let's see if I can find it here. Okay, I think it is the Smart Recorder. Okay, it's a free app. And if you notice, there's a little button on it. You push the red button and you're recording. Okay, it's very simple. And when you're done, you stop and then you can you can pause it you can keep it going and what i did is that i decided well i wanted to explore the watersheds of lawrence uh, of east lawrence and also some of the natural areas and so i did a um, i started at a park where everybody who wanted to and this was a self-guided tour is what i created because what we originally were going to do of course was have a nature hike where everybody would come together and we would take the hike and I would show the highlights and people would ask questions. And then the pandemic happened. So we had to figure out a way to do this. Um, and so what I came up with is this simple recording device. And you, you know, I started in a place where every, anybody could start. And it was at a gazebo at South Park, which is a, a central, uh, just on the west edge of East Lawrence. And I started walking and I recorded what I saw. And it, it was very simple. I had a map of the watershed so I could talk about, okay, this side of the street flows north into the Kaw River through 
uh, Downtown Creek, and then this one flows to the east to Burroughs Creek, and we'll be getting to that, and you can see that pretty soon. And so I was able to show, you know, how watersheds work, and I talked about how important watersheds are. Animals, animals don't have faucets and cups, but they still have to drink. And so, you know, every other animal that lives in East Lawrence or your neighborhood or anywhere in the country, they, they get drinks. And the way they find that is very simple. They go downhill. And basically, the, probably the first time they go to a creek or to a, a pond, they're, they're brought there by their parents, okay? So they know where that is. And yet anywhere you go in Lawrence or in your neighborhood or in, in any country uh, on the planet for that matter, you just go downhill and you find the creek or you find the, the lake or you find the, the, the marsh. And that's where life is. And so that's why it's so important to know what the watersheds are. And every one of your backyards is connected to a stream or a lake or and and one of the coolest things i like to do is to take a watershed walk where i will take um basically go into my backyard and then say okay where does where is the nearest creek and then i find it and so i take a walk and then i realize okay what other areas are drained by this creek and so all of the the area that is drained by that creek is impacting your backyard and your backyard is impacting it because we all live downstream somebody lives upstream from you it's impacting you and what happens in your backyard affects you plus like i was getting back to on this walk is that watersheds are important because if you want to see wildlife you can find it there so um Basically, can, can yeah. I interject for just a minute? Yeah. One of the things that I wanted to show people, and I don't know, that's probably not showing up really well on the screen, but there is um, the Blue River in the Kansas City area, like I mentioned earlier, goes through the entire city. And there's a great map that the um, uh, the sit through the city of Kansas City, Missouri and Heartland Conservation Alliance came up with, and it's just called Renew the Blue. And it's this great map that shows you, and you can see the river and its tributaries and the streets that they're on. And, and um, it's marked with all the different parking places that you can go to and the trailheads. And it's a very simple map that um, we'll include in the link and it's, it's fantastic. So you can, just like Ken's saying, he was kind of in the heart of Lawrence, but there's still this sense of being permeated by the watershed that that area is in. So it's really helpful for us, I think, to be able to combine what we know about place, the street, the side street, the highways, right, the locations, the city names, but to overlay that with the actual river in this case and to get a little different perspective and feel. So that was it. I just want to say that I'll, I'll put that link in the uh, email after. And I, I think that's a uh, that's wonderful because, um, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's good to have a little bit of an orientation to watersheds. And if you have a map that can help you sort out, you know, what's going on, but it's really very exciting, particularly for kids once again, to figure out where, what is the watershed area uh, that I'm a part of? How, do I, how does our yard fit into that? And where in the watershed of that creek is it? And so it really transforms a neighborhood to know that it's part of a watershed that goes to the Missouri River or to, you know, head south towards the Ozarks or, you know, there's different things depending on where you are. And it, it, it's, it's just a really neat thing. Uh, but anyway, to get back to my recordings, what I did, and there's a map, and I can, I can provide those, uh, uh, you know, the links basically that outlines my map. It's easy to make a map. Uh, that shows just with a line drawing where you where you walked 
And then what I did is that I took the recording, uploaded it to the cloud, and uh, or actually I think I uploaded it to my, my laptop, and there's a, a freeware program called Audacity uh, that is an excellent, excellent uh, a tape, uh, audio recording, editing program. And it makes, you know, as you're walking, if it's a, for somebody else to listen to, they don't want to listen to you walking for five minutes for, from going from point A to point B. You can take that part out of your recording if you forget to hit the spot. Or if there's, if you're going uphill and there's, there's a pause because you're catching your breath, you can take that pause out. And you can make it a much more compact. I think I, I had like, I don't know, 55, 60 minutes of recording and I was able to con condense it to like 20 minutes uh, by doing that. And, and you can even have destination points if you describe where you're at for the next spot, then you can have like a transitional music. I have a daughter who makes music and I use it on the recording to kind of time is passing now, you know, do, 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 and then you're to the next spot. And so that way, different people walking on it have different speeds. Somebody may be in a, a wheelchair even, or, or a walker, or need a cane, and they just don't have the, the speed of a 17-year-old or, or a, a you know 10-year-old or whatever. And so everybody's gonna have their own pace, and that way you can, you can synchronize it that way. And then, you know, you, what I did after I, I got through editing it is uploaded it to a place called SoundCloud. SoundCloud is a, a free place that you can upload it to, and you have a link then uh, that it'll create that will take people to that, and then you just share that link. And it can be on a web page, it could be on a Facebook page, it could be on a, a different um, places. And of course, with that, if you wanted to be taking pictures along the way, you could take those pictures and upload them to Google Photos and make an album out of it so that they could uh, show people what's going on. And so, you know, typically I don't like to have, um, you know, I want people to experience with the bioregional jump, you, you put this in your pocket and you leave it. And so that you you have the sensory world, but sometimes it's really good to have some guided help because uh, you know some people they don't know what they're looking at or or they they they're a little bit nervous about stuff or they have a lot of questions that they don't know how to find the answers to, and so you can provide them with this. They learn from this and then. I think Ken's system has frozen. That's not good. Oh, he must have lost his connection. He's not in the meeting any longer. Well, that's too bad. I'm sure he'll be back. <laughs> so, let's see. We have about 20 more minutes. I'm sure he'll be back. I'm going to go on mute and see if I can connect with him on, on the phone. So I'm wondering, um, Joy, would you be interested in chatting a little bit about 
your walks that you take and how you do it and when you decide whether you want to um, share them with people or what you do with them. Do you, you feel like doing that for a few minutes? Yeah. Um, when I take walks, it's actually for, for very personal reasons that I need to be refreshed. So it's, of course, our, our nonprofit is, um, the, the whole game of that is to, to get people to um, engage more with nature. Um, but in, in my personal life, I really need nature in my life. And it's been the fastest, most effective way to get back to a um, present uh, peace of mind. If, if there's just too much going on and I'm starting to feel um, kind of feelings of overwhelm, then uh, finding a spot, even if I only have like a 30 minute break in my schedule, finding a spot where I can even just drive to some place and sit at an outlook or on the side of the road or um, in a parking spot that has trees, I can roll down the windows and hear the sounds of birds um, or hear a, the sound of a, a stream rolling by. It's just the most quick way that I know to, to resume um, a handle on a very busy lifestyle. So um, I know there are some people who, are, uh, who might be professionals and, and have to deal with that or may have a lot going on with family life and um, sometimes overwhelm can uh, get us to a point where we're not managing the ups and downs of daily life as we would like to. And it's just an interesting um, kind of go-to that I've always gone and been able to connect quite, pretty easily and, and with low cost. So I find that to be um, the most promising thing about nature walks and getting people to, to, um, to get to know nature uh, getting people to connect to nature. The best thing about all of that is that it's low cost and there's, um, there's no barrier to entry. You can ex access that um, mental health so uh, self coping uh, mechanism without having to do anything extra than just going outside and finding a spot that um, has a lot of natural features. Um, I'm, I might have gone off topic. What do you think, Sammy? <laughs> there is no off topic. Oh, it comes to the <laughs> emotional benefits, the physical benefits, and the spiritual benefits of time spent in nature. So, no, it's, it's what it's all about, you know. And I, I know that everybody in this group has been part of the resilient activists. Like, I think most of you have been to our climate conversations in the past. And it's that whole well-rounded awareness of all the benefits, not just the one single thing, you know. So, no, this is wonderful. Um, thank you, Joy. Thanks for just jumping in there. Ken lost his connection. Looks like he's back with us. So we'll switch back to you, Ken. And uh, we'll see you later, Joy. <laughs> Okay, thanks. I don't know what happened. Uh, I was suddenly talking to a blank screen, so I decided to move inside. It's, uh, you know, we have uh, great benefits for living in the country, but one of them is not internet connection. I have a DSL connection and it's very slow and, and uh, apparently intermittent. So uh, anyway, back again. So does anybody have any questions about uh the technology there's many many different ways to do it uh in terms of recording your own walks um and i think that um you know zoom is another way that you can if if you want to record things uh it's difficult uh i don't know i have not tried using zoom on my smartphone but my son has and has really done a good job of showing me the potential for using Zoom live for if you're wanting to take somebody on a walk, you can actually do that. Um, 
which is kind of neat if somebody's not in the area. Um, so has anybody had other experiences of making recordings that they want to share or have questions about? So feel free to just unmute yourself. Even as administrator, I don't have the right to unmute any of you. So if anyone wants to, has something to share or has a question, um, this is a great time to throw that out. We've actually found a lot of success with Facebook. Um, we have a Facebook page and it's, we use it to connect with, uh, to see how effective our communications are and what people are interested in because there's a lot of immediate um, feedback that Facebook can give. Um, but the, when we, when we have volunteer events or when we're out and we notice something really lovely, we can just kind of use the app on our phone and create a Facebook Live and uh, go live straight from the page so that then that Facebook Live, um, when it ends, we have the option of keeping the post or deleting it if we think it was silly or didn't go well. Um, but the ones where the, that are kept um, seemingly have a lot better engagement than any other graphic post or um, text post that we'll do. So we've kind of fallen to the point, we've fallen back into um, not really doing the graphic um, graphic stuff that some some pages will do as a best practice. We actually just kind of rely on video. Yeah, that's really helpful. We um, you can actually take the Facebook video, also the Facebook Live, and you can download that video. So you can actually keep that MP3 or whatever format it ends up in. And we've done that with a few where then we can put it on our own YouTube channel and link to that from our website. So we own that video, it's ours now. If it stays on Facebook only, you might not have control <clears throat> in the future, you know, because who knows right. what Facebook could decide to do. But it, it can be really easy to do that. Um, I was just going to to offer that Ken and Joy and I have, when we were talking yesterday, we would love to have a site available where any of you can either come and watch or listen to videos that others have created. And we would love to have you submit yours to us. If there's any time that you're on a walk and you're like, you know, I sound pretty good, or this is such a cool thing, like, like Mary Beth, just was meandering around her yard during the break. It can be kind of a community building space and that's, and so we would like to offer that. We haven't quite worked out any of the details, but um, we'd love to have you let me know if you do a recording um, that you'd like to submit. And if you don't know how to do the technology of sending it out to me or to Ken or however we do it, um, we'll help you do that. There was one other suggestion that I had that I have found really helpful over the years. Knowing that time spent in nature and time spent in meditation are two of the most profound resilience tools. Time spent in nature in meditation is the best resilience tool, right? And it's really helpful. You can just even use the voice memo on your phone. You don't have to have the video to guide yourself on a meander in nature in a meditative state. So whether you call it a walking meditation or just this deep immersion where you do Ken's jump into out of your you know, square-minded thoughts into the place and you say it out loud, you speak it out loud, you notice your breathing and you're recording that at the same time, you can play that back for yourself anytime. And you can re-experience all the benefits of that time spent in nature and that time spent in deep meditation, noticing the details, noticing through all of your senses where you are. So those are just some of the ideas um, that we have had about how you can have your experience 
and take it with you. Like that was really a big part of what we wanted to present today. Um, I want to say two things before um, before I let Ken just finish up. We have about uh, eight more minutes here. Then we're going to break at right about noon. And but if you go a few minutes over, I'm okay with that. And we'll come back at one with Joy on this same Zoom link. So you can. I'll leave it open if anybody, you know, if you want to just leave your Zoom open or you can close it, go have some lunch, go outside, go try recording a little sweet spot outside, whatever you'd like to do. It's, it's a beautiful day. Um, typically when we do our resilient activist climate conversations, our usually third Saturday of the month program, we have our birdhouse sitting out on the table uh, that says donations on it. And a lot of times people will drop some cash in, occasionally a check. And it's amazing, it's delightful, and we love to have your support. Today, we would like to request that if you would like to make a donation, if you find this really helpful, nourishing and uplifting, we would love to have you make a donation to Joy's organization instead to clementwaters.org and it's c-l-e-m-e-n-t as the opposite of inclement clement so you know peace and joy and equanimity clementwaters.org so um i think that was all that i highlighted i wanted to be sure to get in we will have um i will send an email to everyone who's registered with all the links that are in this recording today, both Ken's and Joy's. Um, and I, I'm envisioning a page to have this recording on it, today's program, with all the links, with some of the helpful hints and things like that that come up. So that I know we will do, right? So that the Resilient Activists will offer that and have that be part, a permanent part of our website. So I am done. Can yeah, go ahead, Joy. Um, you asked yesterday if I could put together a resource page for um, places where around Kansas City, where if you need to get away and be immersed in nature and find that that solace. Um, some of our favorites, we I think we've found we highlighted seven different locations uh, at various spots in Kansas City. Um, where you can go and feel like you are out of the city, but you didn't drive too far. So that mm -hmm. is actually, yeah, that's actually uh, linked on the front page of our website now, thanks to Sammy's suggestion. <laughs> Excellent, and we will link that to your link. Right. Um, the and other I thing I just want to say for any of you who were not, because I know a number of you were not going to be able to be in the afternoon part of this program, um, Joy's going to be spending a little more time on feeling safe in nature. Ken spent time talking about ticks and sugars and all that kind of mosquitoes and sunscreen, but Joy's going to take it from a little deeper perspective. And I know many of you were at our climate conversations two months ago when we got into a deep discussion on feeling safe in nature. And we know that this is a really important topic. So even if you can't be here this afternoon, know that that's going to be part of the content and when we put this recording up you can go back and listen to that part so anyway that's it ken take it away you're you're well, it's up to just, you to finish how you like yeah in wrapping up the uh one of the things that you can do uh i talk a lot about in my essays where you really should keep your smartphone in your pocket and you should have an unmediated relationship with nature because that's how we are wired and how nature is, is wired. Uh, and, and then I talk about, uh, you know, making an audio recording with these things and, and whatnot. I just wanted to say that uh, they don't have to be mutually exclusive. Um, they also um, sometimes, particularly now when you're, we're more solitary, we're not taking groups. One of the great, greatest ways to learn about nature is to take it with another person. You can still do that in a socially distanced way, particularly somebody who is uh, maybe knows their plants and animals or has an experience, a relationship that they've developed that they want to share with you about certain things found in the landscapes that we live in. 
that's great. Uh, you can also, though, just occasionally, if you have a, a plant that you're just drawn to but you don't know the name of, take a picture of it. And then uh, later you can look it up. It's very easy to, to there's even Google uh, apps that will identify plants for you sometimes or animals. Uh, there's lots of ways to do that. And that way you can deepen your relationship after the fact and, and you know, not make it real intrusive in your walk. Uh, and, and yet, uh, uh, you know, take advantage of what's available. There's lots and lots of online resources and apps that can help you but just uh, you know, keep it to a minimum because our our whole relationship with nature begins with our our own senses and the senses of nature interacting with each other. So that's where the the focus, the most healing occurs in that relationship. And I don't know. I think that's maybe a good place to stop. Uh, Ken, I'm just. So delighted with just your insight, your knowledge, your attention to um, every aspect of our human relationship to the earth. And I'm, I'm very grateful. So I just invite again, open up to anyone who has any comments to just unmute yourself and we'd love to hear your feedback. Ken, it's Mary. Yeah. Um, do, you were talking about your wife and her music and your daughter if there are any links to their um whatever they're producing or their facebook or you know pages whatever i'd be interested in seeing that it sounds like that sure. you all are in harmony with your work in different ways yeah well um i will do that i'll i'll maybe uh, provide some information that are you know that can be connected to this talk and i also i did make a brief list also of some lawrence uh hiking areas too and uh so i'll send that to sammy too uh, as far as uh uh connecting it to this as well um my my daughter is in the twin city areas and she she produces electronic dance music which is not exactly uh the same as nature right. <laughs> But she was raised in the country and she knows her way around. So, uh, so one other thing, um, the, um, there's an app, it's um, iNaturalist, I think, or iNature. Yes. I nature. Yeah. And so um, that's really good. I use that a lot. And you can just, you can take a picture and you can um, save it or you can try to identify it right there. It's, you, you, you take the picture and then it says, what, do you, what did you see? And there's... Um, uh, suggestions but it also um, saves your exact location where you took it so if you want to go back there to observe again it's a good way to um, kind of keep a diary of where There's you lots of birds that bird apps that do the same thing too I love that because for example um, there's some plants, as the native plants are really a lot slower, many of them to emerge than some of our non-native plants. And so right now, for example, the evening primrose in my yard is about that tall, my fingers the right way, and they're kind of bright red shoots. And I was like, what is that? Right. But it was really interesting. And of course I knew because I planted it there, but it would be really cool to take a snapshot of exactly where that is and go back next week and go back the following week and kind of follow that plant through its season. So thank you for that. I hadn't realized the location piece on that app. Barbara, you had something you want to say? Yeah, the whole time we've been talking here today, I've been remembering my grandfather who had a 35 acre subsistence farm and we lived right next to them, but not on the farm. And he would take us on these walks as you were talking about and, and he had all that knowledge he only had a sixth grade education but you know if he had been able to write it down we would have had this particular 35 acres and he could read the sky he could read the soil he could read the plants he could read the animals and you know i realize how much we've lost of that ability so mm -hmm. i'm moved to write down the stories i can remember anyway so i'll be doing that when i get Great. a chance thank you for I love that it. And 
I know a website where you could post those blog posts if you would write it that way. I'm just going to put it out there. I know someone who do a little editorial and add your headings and whatever, but um, that would be delightful. You know somebody, do you? I know. Just let, yeah. Call me. I'll, I'll put you in touch with someone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Judy? This was super. This was super. And in Barbara, what you were saying, I grew up on a, on a dairy farm and it burned down and we had to move into Prairie Village and I was lost, absolutely lost because I wandered all over the place by myself and uh, it was very difficult for the longest time. Yeah, yeah. Joy? Um, I was going to ask, so, so many of us remember our grandparents doing weird things like telling us about the woolly worms, um, you know, how high they go up on a trees means, you know, how high the floodwaters are going to be in that particular <laughs> area or whatever. Um, or, you know, counting the number of fogs in August to predict the number of snows in the winter, <laughs> or, you know, things like, like that, that um, just kind of got that were pre prevalent in maybe farming communities or rural communities, but then haven't um, haven't really been remembered generation to generation. Um, where where can we uh, tell stories about that and and um, kind of memorialize the experience that we were able to to glean? Yeah, I I'm not aware of a site. I'm. I know that the Farmer's Almanac, which is still published, has a lot of that, those little vignettes that are available when they, um, on their website or the, you know, you can get a full year of the Farmer's Almanac in, in printed form. And a lot of those are in there, but um, that'll be a great thing to begin to acquire. So anybody else, Ken, do you have a, a site? Yeah, or does everybody, does anybody remember there was a series called Foxfire? Yeah. Uh, it was a series of books that was put out about Appalachian uh, folk knowledge. And they were just an encyclopedia. There's probably 15 of them put out that were just fantastic. Where they, it was slice of life, you know. It was, it was a lot of times it was youth who were going to, you know, the old geezer up in the holler uh, and talking to him and learning about all kinds of things. A lot of it was focused on how to make things or how to garden or how to, uh, you know, do different things uh, to make a subsistence living. But a lot of it was also mixed into all that was nature observations and they were fantastic. Um, it looks like Mary Beth might have a copy of the book there. It's it's really dark. Oh. What's it called? The Wildfire or Foxfire book. Oh great. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> it's one. I think it might be the first one. I have collected them here and there over the years. Yeah, they're fantastic. <laughs> and and they were basically that same same impulse that you're talking about is trying to gather stuff before it was all gone. And uh, it would be really cool to have you know, I don't know if they have a website. Uh, if they okay. had a website, I wonder if they would have a place uh, where you could start uh, doing your own repository. You know, there's there's something called StoryCorps. Uh, you've probably heard it on NPR. Yeah. They have a free app that you can download and you can have stories that are uh, told. And you, you do your own recording and then they will actually save them. And uh, that would be a cool subsection, I think, of, you know, nature observations, folk nature observations. Uh, that would be kind of cool to make. Those are just a couple of thoughts that come to my mind. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, I think Smithsonian um, website has something like that, too, where you can record, record your stories and share them. And it might be... There might be something there. This has been so wonderful. Um, I just can't express how exciting I how excited I am about just the content of what's come out, and you know, of course, just what I know 
any of us need is a little more something to do in our lives. But this is an important thing. And this is like a real, um, it feels very robust. This feels like a very robust connection, um, kind of a healing space. You know, we've been in this, oh, sequestered indoors. And now what do I do? And I, you know, we've lost our footing and we, you know, not, maybe we've lost our toilet paper. We don't know what we've lost. We just know that we've lost what we had for a long time. And what a great, um, just uplift to say, wow, here are some things really concrete and simple and free that I can do. And it's, you know, it's just going to be uplifting and healing and joyful and things you can share with people other people and um i'm so grateful ken to you and and to joy and we'll see you in a little bit um for everything that you've done and everything that you offer so go get his sammy, book <clears throat> sammy well, i would like you. to say thank you for doing all of this um it's really been great i wish i could stay all day but thank you again thank, thank you. you and i'm gonna buy your book too thanks great, and, mary uh, see you in the future I'm uh, going to grab a bite to eat, and I'll be right back, Joy. <laughs> Thank you. We'll Good to see everybody. Thank, Thank you, guys. You. Thank you. Right. Thank you.